Hello, my name is Sin Bagley, and I'm reading The Skylark of Space by E.E. E. Doug Smith in collaboration with uh, Lee Hawkins Garvey. And this is Chapter 9, Lost in Space. For 48 hours, the uncontrolled atomic motor dragged the meshless vessel with its four unconscious passengers through the illimitable reaches of empty space with an awful and constantly increasing velocity. When only a few traces of copper remained in the power plant, the acceleration began to decrease and the powerful springs began to restore the floor and the seats to their normal positions. The last particle of copper having been transformed into energy, the speed of the vessel became constant. Apparently motionless to those inside it, it was in reality traversing space with a velocity thousands of times greater than that of light. As the force which had been holding them down was relaxed, the lungs, which had been able to secure only air enough to maintain four sparks of life, began to function more normally, and soon all four recovered consciousness, drinking in the life-giving oxygen in a rapid succession of breaths so deep that it seemed as though their lungs must burst with each inhalation. Duchesne was the first to gain control of himself. His first effort to rise to his feet lifted him from the floor and he floated lightly to the ceiling, striking it with a gentle bump and remaining suspended in the air. The others, who had not yet attempted to move, stared at him in wide-eyed amazement. Reaching out and clutching one of the supporting columns, he drew himself back to the floor and cautiously removed his leather suit, transferring two heavy automatic pistols as he did so. By gingerly filling of his injured body, he discovered that no bones were broken, although he was terribly bruised. He then glanced around to learn how his companions were faring. He saw that they were all sitting up, the girls resting, Perkins removing his aviator costume. Good morning, Dr. Duchesne. What happened when I kicked your friend? Duchesne smiled. Good morning, Mrs. Vanman. Several things happened. He fell into the controls, turning on all the juice. We left shortly afterward. I tried to shut the power off, and in doing so, balled things up worse than ever. Then I went to sleep and just woke up. Have you any idea where we are? No, but I can make a fair estimate, I think. And glancing at the empty chamber in which... The bar had been. He took out his notebook and pen and figured for a few minutes. As he finished, he drew himself along by the handrail to one of the windows and to another. He returned with a puzzled expression on his face and made a long calculation. I don't know exactly what to make of this, he said thoughtfully. We are so far away from the earth that even the fixed car stars are unrecognizable. The power was on exactly 48 hours, since that is the life of the particular bar under full current. We should still be close to our own solar system since it was theoretically impossible to develop any philosophy greater than that of light. But in fact, we have. I know enough about astronomy to recognize the fixed stars from any point within a light year or so of the sun, and I can't see a single familiar star. I never could see how mass could be a function of velocity, and I am convinced that it is not. We have been accelerating for 48 hours. He turned to Dorothy. While we were unconscious, Mrs. Vainman, we had probably attained a velocity of something like 7,413,000,000 miles per second, and that is the approximate speed at which we are now traveling. We must be nearly 6 quadrillion miles, and that is the space of several hundred light years away from our solar system, or more plainly, about six times as far away from our Earth as the North Star is. We couldn't see our sun with a telescope, even if we knew which way to look for it. At this paralyzing news, Dorothy's face turned white and Margaret Spencer quietly fainted in her seat. Then we can never go back, said Dorothy slowly. At this question, Perkins' self-control gave way and his thin veneer of decency disappeared completely. You got us into this whole thing, he screamed as he leaped at Dorothy with a murderous fury gleaming in his pale eyes and his fingers curved into talons. Instead of reaching her, however, he merely sprawled grotesquely in midair. And Duchesne knocked him clear across the vehicle with one power blow of his fist. Get back there, you cowardly cur, he said evenly. Even though we are a long way from home, try to remember your man at least. One more break like that and I'll throw you out the boat. It isn't her fault that we are out here, but our own. The blame for it is a very small matter anyway. The thing of importance is to get back as soon as possible. But how can we get back, asked Perkins suddenly from the corner where he was crouching. Fear in every feature, the power's gone, the controls are wrecked, and we are hopelessly lost in space. 
I wouldn't say hopelessly, returned the other. I have never been in any situation yet that I couldn't get out of, and I won't be convinced until I'm dead that I can't get out of this one. We have two extra bars. We can fix the board, and if, we, it can, if I can't navigate us back close enough to our solar system to find it, I am more of a dub than I think I am. How about a little bite to eat? Show us where it is, exclaimed Dorothy. Now that you mention it, I find that I am starved to death. Duchesne looked at her keenly. I admire your nerve, Mrs. Vanman. I don't suppose that the animal over there would show such a wide streak of yellow, but I was rather afraid that you girls might go to pieces. I'm scared blue, of course, Dorothy admitted frankly, but hysterics won't do any good, and we simply must get back. Certainly we must and we will, stated Duchesne calmly. If you like, you might find something for us to eat in the galley there, where, well, I see what I can do with this board that I wrecked with my head. By the way, that cubby hole there is an apartment reserved for you two ladies. We are in rather cramped quarters, but I think you will find everything you need. As Dorothy drew herself along the handrail toward the room designated, accompanied by the other girl who, though conscious, had paid little attention to anything around her, she could not help feeling a thrill of admiration for the splendid villain who had abducted her, calm and cool, always master of himself, apparently paying no attention to the terrible bruises which transfigured half his face and doubtless half his body as well. She admitted to herself that it was only his example which had enabled her to maintain her self-control in their pl present plight. As she crawled over Perkins' discarded suit, she remembered that he had not taken any weapons from it. After a rapid glance around to assure herself that she was not being watched, she quickly searched the coat, bringing the, to light not one but two pistols, which she threw, dr thrust into her pocket. She saw with relief that they were regulation army automatics, with whose use she was familiar from much target practice with Seton. In the room, which was a miniature of the one she had seen on the Skylark, the girls found clothing, toilet articles, and everything necessary for a long trip. <clears throat> As they were setting themselves to rights, Dorothy electing to stay in her riding suit, they surveyed each other frankly, and each was reassured by what she saw. Dorothy saw a girl, 22, of her own stature, with a mass of heavy, wavy, black hair. Her eyes, a singularly rich and deep brown, contrasted strangely with a beautiful ivory of her skin. She was normally a beautiful girl, thought Dorothy, but her beauty was marred by suffering and privation. <clears throat> her naturally slender, slender form was thin. Her face was haggard and worn. The stranger broke the silence. I'm, Margaret, I'm Margaret Spencer, she began abruptly, former secretary to His Royal Highness Brookings of the Steel. He swindled my father out of an invention worth millions, and he died brokenhearted. I got the job to see if I couldn't get enough evidence to convict them, and I had quite a lot when they caught me. I had some things that they were afraid to lose, and I had them so well hidden they couldn't find them, so they kidnapped me to make me give them back. They haven't dared kill me so far for fear the evidence will show up after my death, which it will. However, I will be legally dead before long, and then they know the whole thing will come out, so they have brought me out here to make me talk or kill me. Talking won't do me any good now, though, and I don't believe it ever would have. They would have killed me after they got the stuff back anyway. So you see, I at least will never get back to the Earth alive. Cheer up. We'll all get back safely. No, we won't. You don't know that man Perkins, if that is his name. I never heard him called any real name before. He is simply unshakable, unspeakable, vile, hideous, everything that is base. He was my jailer, and I utterly loathe and despise him. He is mean, underhanded, and tricky. He reminds me of a slimy, poisonous snake. He will kill me, I know it. But how about Dr. Duchesne? Surely he isn't that kind of man. He wouldn't let him. I've never met him before, but from what I heard from him in the office, he's even worse than Perkins, but in an entirely different way. There's nothing small or mean about him, and I don't believe he would go out of his way to hurt anyone, as Perkins would. But he is absolutely cold and hard, a perfect fiend. Where his interests are concerned, there is nothing under the sun, good or bad, that he won't do. But I'm glad that Perkins had me instead of the doctor, as they call him. Perkins raises such a bitter personal feeling that anyone would rather die than give him up to him anything. Duchesne, however, would have tortured me impersonally and scientifically. Cold and self-contained and all the while using the most efficient methods. I'm sure he would have got it out of me some way. He always gets what he goes after. Oh, come, Miss Spencer. Dorothy interrupted the half-hysterical girl. You're too hard on him. Don't, did you see him knock Perkins down when he came after me? 
Well, maybe he has a few gentlemanly instincts, which he uses when he doesn't lose anything by it. More likely, he merely intended to rebuke him for a useless action. He's a firm pragmatist. Anything that's useful is all right. Anything that is useless is a crime. More probably yet, he wants you left alive. Of course, that is his real reason. He went to the trouble of kidnapping you, so naturally he won't let Perkins or anybody else kill you until he is through with you. Otherwise, he would have let Perkins do anything he wanted to without lifting a finger. I can't quite believe that, Dorothy replied, though a cold chill struck at her heart as she remembered the inhuman crime attributed to this man, and she quailed at the thought of being in his charge. Countless millions of miles from Earth, a thought only partially counteracted by the fact that she was now armed. He has treated us with every consideration so far. Let's hope for the best. Anyway, I'm sure that we'll get back safely. Why so sure? Have you something up your sleeve? No, or, yes, in a way I have, though nothing very definite. I'm Dorothy Vain Vainman, and I am engaged to the man who discovered the thing that makes this space car go. That's why the kid meant to you then, to make him give up all his rights to it. It's like them. Yes, I think that's why they did it, but they won't keep me long. Dick Seaton will find me. I know. I feel it. But that's exactly what they want, cried Margaret, excitedly. In my spying around, I heard a little about this very thing. The name Seaton brings it to my mind. This car is broken in some way, so that will kill him the first time he tries to run it. That's where they underestimated Dick and his partner. You have heard of Martin Crane, of course. I think I heard his name mentioned in the office together with Seaton's, but that's all. Well, besides other things, Martin is quite a wonderful mechanic, and he found out that our sc Skylark was spoiled, so they built another one, a lot bigger, and I'm sure they are following us right now. But how can they possibly follow us when we are going so fast and are so far away, queried the other girl, once more despondent. I don't quite know, but I do know that Dick will find a way. He's simply wonderful. He knows more now than that Dr. Duchesne will ever learn in all his life, and he will find us in a few days. I feel it in my bones. Besides, I picked Birkin's pockets of these two pistols. Can you shoot an automatic? Yes, replied the other girl as she seized one of the guns, assured herself that his magazine was full, and slipped it into her pocket. I need used to practice a lot with my father's. This makes me feel a whole lot better. And call me Peggy, will you? It will seem good to hear my name again, and after what I've been through lately, even this trip will be a vacation for me. Well, then cheer up, Piggy dear. We're going to be great friends. Let's go get us all something to eat. It's simply starved, and I know you are, too. The presence of the pistol in her pocket and Dorothy's unwavering faith in her lover lifted the stranger out of the mood of despair into which she, the long imprisonment, the brutal treatment, and the present situation had plunged her, and she was almost cheerful as they drew themselves along the hand rail leading to the tiny galley. I simply can't get used to the idea of nothing having any weight. Look here, laughed Dorothy, <coughs> as she took a boiled ham. <clears throat> out of the refrigerator and it hung upon an imaginary hook of the air where it remained motionless. Doesn't it make you feel funny? It is a queer sensation. I feel light like a toy balloon and I feel awfully weird inside. If we have no weight, why does it hurt so when we bump into anything? And when you throw anything like the doctor did Perkins, why does it hurt as hard as ever? It's mass or inertia or something like that. A thing has it everywhere whether it weighs anything or not. Dick, Dick explained it all to me. I understood it when he told me about it, but I'm afraid it didn't sink in very deep. Did you ever study physics? I had a year of it in college, but it was more or less of a joke. I went to a girls' school, and all we had to do in physics was to get the credit. We didn't have to learn it. Me too. Next time I go to school, I'm going to Yale or Harvard or some such place, and I'll learn so much mathematics and science that I'll have to wear a bandu to keep my massive intellect in place. During this conversation, they had prepared a substantial luncheon and arranged it daintily upon two large trays in spite of the difficulty caused by the fact that nothing would remain in place by its own weight. The feast prepared, Dorothy took her, way, took her tray from the table as carefully as she could and saw the sandwiches and bottles start to flow toward the ceiling. Hastily inverting the tray above the escaping viands, she pushed them back down upon the table. In doing so, she lifted herself clear from the floor as she had forgotten to hold herself down. 
What do, what we do, what do we do anyway? She wailed when she recovered her position. Everything wants to fly all over the place. <clears throat> Put another tray on top of it and hold it together. I wish we had a bird cage that we could open the door and grab a sandwich as it flies out. Mm. By covering the trays, the girls finally carried the luncheon out into the main compartment where they gave to Shane and Perkins one of the trays and all fell to eating hungrily. Duchesne passed. Duchesne paused with a glint of amusement in his one eye as he saw Dorothy trying to, to pour ginger ale out of a bottle. <coughs> it can't be done, Miss Vanman. You'll have to drink it through a straw. That will work since our air pressure is normal. Be careful not to choke on it, though. Your swallowing will have to be all muscular out here. Gravity won't help you. Or, wait a bit, I have the control board fixed and it will be a matter of only a minute to put in another bar and get enough acceleration to take the place of gravity. He placed one of the extra power bars in the chamber and pushed the speed lever into the first notch. There was a lurch of the whole vessel as it swung around the bar so that the floor was once more perpendicular to it. He took a couple of steps, returned, and advanced the lever another notch. As about, there's, there's that about the same gravity. Now we can act like human beings and eat in comfort. That's a wonderful relief, cried Dorothy. Are we going back toward the earth? Not yet. I reversed the bar, but we have to use up all of this one before we can even start back. Till this bar is gone, we will merely be slowing down. As the meal progressed, Dorothy noticed that Duchesne's left arm seemed almost helpless, and that he ate with great difficulty because of his terribly bruised face. And as soon as they removed the tray, she went into a room where she saw a small medicine chest and brought out a couple of bottles. Lie down here, Dr. Duchesne, she commanded. I'm going to apply a little first aid to the injured. Arnica and Iodine are all I can find, but they'll help a little. I'm all right, began the scientist, but at her imperious gesture he submitted, and she bathed his battered features with a healing lotion and painted the burst bruises with Iodine. I see your arm is lame. Where does it hurt? Shoulders the worst. I rammed it through the ward when we started out. He opened his shirt at the throat and bared his shoulder, and Dorothy gasped as much as the size and power of the muscles displayed as the extent and severity of the man's injuries. Stepping into the gallery, she brought out the hot water and towels and gently bathed away the clotted blood that had been forced through the skin. Massage it a little with arnica as I move the arm, he directed coolly, and she did so pityingly. He did not wince and made no sign of pain, but she saw beads of perspiration appear upon his face and wondered at his fortitude. That's fine, he said gratefully as she finished, and a peculiar expression came over his face. Feels 100% better already, but why do you do it? I should think you would feel crowning me with that basin instead of playing nurse. Efficiency, she replied with a smile. I'm taking a leaf out of your own book. You are our chief engineer, engineer you know, and we won't do to have you laid up. That's a logical explanation, but doesn't go far enough, he rejoined. Still studying her intently, she did not reply, but turned to Perkins. How are you, Mr. Perkins? Do you require medical assistance? No, growled Perkins from the seat in which he had crouched immediately after eating. Keep away from me or I'll cut your heart out. Shut up, snapped Duchesne. Remember what I said? I haven't done anything, snarled the other. I said I would throw you out if you made another break, Duchesne informed him evenly. And I mean it. If you can't talk decently, keep still. Understand that you are to keep off Mrs. Vanman. Miss Vanman words and actions. I'm in charge of her and I will put whip with no interference whatever. This is your last warning. How about Spencer then? I have nothing to say about her. She's not mine, responded to Shane with a shrug. An evil eye appeared in Perkins' eyes as he took out a wicked looking knife and began to strap it carefully upon the leather of the street, blurring at his victim. The while. Well, I have something to say, blazed Dorothy, but she was silenced by a gesture from Margaret, who calmly took the pistol from her pocket, jerked the side back, throwing a cartridge into the chamber, and held the weapon up on one finger, admiring it from all sides. Don't worry about his knife. He's been sharpening it for my benefit for the last month. He doesn't mean anything by it. At this unexpected show of resistance, Perkins stared at her for an instant, then glanced at his coat. Yes, this was yours once. You needn't bother picking up your coat. They're both gone. You might be tempted to throw that knife, so drop it in the floor and kick it over to me before I count two, three. One. The heavy pistol steadied into line with his chest and her finger tightened on the trigger. Two. 
He obeyed, and she picked up the knife. He turned to Duchesne, who had watched the scene unmoved, a faint smile upon his Saturn face. Doctor, he cried, shaking with her, why don't you shoot her or take that gun from her? Surely you don't want to see me murdered. Why not? replied Duchesne calmly. It's nothing to me whether she kills you or you kill her. You brought it on yourself for your own carelessness. Any man with brains doesn't leave guns lying around within reach of prisoners, and a blind man could have seen Mrs. Vanman getting your hardware. You saw her take them and you didn't warn me? croaked Perkins. Why should I warn you? If you can't take care of your own prisoner, she earns her liberty, as far as I am concerned. I never did like your style, Perkins, especially your methods of handling, or rather mishandling, women. You could have made her give up the stuff she recovered from that ass Brookings inside of an hour, and wouldn't have had to kill her afterward, either. How? sneered the other. If you're so good at that kind of thing, why didn't you try it on Seton and Crane? There are seven different methods to use a woman like Miss Spencer, each of which will produce the desired result. The reason I did not try them on either Seton or Crane is that they would have failed. Your method of indirect action is probably the only one that will succeed. That's why I adopted it. Well, what are you going to do about it, shrieked Perkins? Are you going to sit there and lecture all day? I'm going to do nothing whatever, answered the scientist coldly. If you had any brains, you would see that you were in no danger. Miss Spencer will undoubtedly kill you if you attack her, not otherwise. This is an Anglo-Saxon weakness. Did you see me take the pistols? queried Dorothy. Certainly, I'm not blind. You have one of them in your right coat pocket now. Why didn't you or don't you try to take it from me? she asked in wonder. If I had objected to your having them, you would never have got them. If I didn't want you to have a gun now, I would take it away from you. You know that, don't you? And his black eyes stared into her violet ones with such calm certainty of his ability that she felt her heart sink. <sighs> Yes, she admitted finally. I believe you could. That is, unless I was angry enough to shoot you. That wouldn't help you. I can shoot faster and straighter than you can and would shoot it out of your hand. However, I have no objections to your having the gun since it is no part of my plan to offer you any further indignity of any kind. Even if you had the necessary coldness of nerves or cruelty of disposition, of which I have one, Perkins the other, and you neither, you would shoot me now, because you can't get back to Earth without me. And after we get back, I will take the guns away from both of you, if I think it's desirable. In the meantime, play with them all you want. Has Perkins any more knives or guns or things in his room, demanded Dorothy. How should I know? Indifferently, then as both girls stared, started for Perkins' room, he ordered briskly, Sit down, Miss Vanman. Let them fight it out. Perkins has his orders to lay off you. You lay off him. I'm not taking any chances of getting you hurt. That's one reason I wanted you armed. If he gets gay, shoot him. Otherwise, hands off completely. Dorothy threw up her head in a defiance. But meeting his cold stare, she paused irresolutely and finally sat down, biting her lips in anger while the other girl went on. That's better. She doesn't need any help to whip that yellow dog. He's whipped already. He never would think of fighting unless the odds were three to one in his favor. When Margaret had returned from the fruitless search of Perkins' room and assured herself that he had no more weapons concealed upon his person, she thrust the pistol back into her pocket and sat down. That ends that, she declared. I guess you will be good now, won't you, Mr. Perkins? Yes. That worthy muttered, I have to be now that you got the drop of me and Duchesne's gone back on me. But wait until we get back. I'll get you then. Stop right there, sharply. There's nothing I would rather do than shoot you right now if you give me the slightest excuse, such as, an, as that name you were about to call me. Now go ahead. Duchesne broke the silence that followed. Well, now that the battle is over, and since we are fed and rested, I suggest that we slow down a bit and get ready to start back. Pick out comfortable seats, everybody, and I'll shoot a little more juice to the bar. Seating himself before the instrument board, he advanced the speed lever slowly until nearly three-quarters of the full power was on, much as he thought the others could stand. For sixty hours, he drove the car, reducing the acceleration only at intervals during which they ate and walked along narrow quarters in order to restore the blood to circulation in their suffering bodies. The power was not reduced for sleep. Everyone slept as best he could. 
Dorothy and Margaret talked together at every opportunity, and a real intimacy grew up between them. Perkins was, for the most part, sullenly quiet, knowing himself despised by all the others and having no outlet here for his particular bland brand of cleverness. Duchesne was always occupied with his work and only occasionally addressed a remark to one or another of the party, except during meals. As those periods of quiet recuperation, he talked easily and well upon many topics. There was no animosity in his bearing, nor did he seem to perceive any directed toward himself. But when any of the others ventured to infringe upon his ideas of how discipline should be maintained, Duchesne's reproof was merciless. Dorothy almost liked him. But Margaret insisted that she considered him worse than ever. When the bar was exhausted, Duchesne lifted the sole remaining cylinder into place. We should be nearly stationary with respect to the earth, he remarked. Now we will start back. Why, it felt as though we were picking up speed for the last three days, exclaimed Margaret. Yes, it feels that way, because we were nothing to judge by. Slowing down in one direction feels exactly like starting up in the opposite one. There is no means of knowing whether we are standing still, going away from Earth, or going toward it, since we have nothing stationary upon which to make observations. However, since the two bars were of exactly the same size and were exerted in opposite directions, except for a few minutes after we left the Earth, we are nearly stationary now. I will put on power until this bar is something less than half gone, then coast for three or four days. By the end of that time, we should be able to recognize our solar system from the appearance of the fixed stars. He again advanced the lever, and for many hours, silence filled the car as it hurtled through space. Duchesne, walking, uh, waking up from a long nap, saw that the bar no longer pointed directly toward the top of the ship, perpendicular to the floor, but was inclined at a steep angle. He reduced the curtain and felt the lurch of the car as it swung around the door, the bar, increasing the angle many degrees. He measured the angle carefully and peered out the windows on one side of the car. Returning the bar to the bar after time, he again measured the angle and found that he had, it had increased greatly. What's the matter, Dr. Duchesne, said Dorothy, who had also been asleep. We're being deflected from our course. You see that bar doesn't point straight anymore? Of course, the direction of the bar hasn't changed. The car has swung around it. What does that mean? We have come close enough to some stars so that its attraction swings the bottom of the car around. Normally, you know, the bottom of the car falls directly behind the bar. It doesn't mean much yet, except that we are being drawn away from our straight line. But if the attraction gets much stronger, it may make us miss our solar system completely. I have been looking for the star in question, but can't see it yet. We'll probably pull away from it very shortly. He threw on the power and for some time watched the bar anxiously, expecting to see it swing back into the vertical, but the angle continually increased. He again reduced the current and searched the heavens for the troublesome body. Do you see it yet? asked Dorothy with concern. No, there's apparently nothing near enough to account for all this deflection. He took out a pair of large night glasses and peered through them for several minutes. Good God, it's a dead sun and we're nearly into it. Look, it looks as large as our moon. Springing to the board, he whirled to the bar into the vertical. He took down a strange in instrument, went to the bottom window, and measured the apparent size of the dark star. Then, after cautioning the rest of the party to sit tight, he advanced the lever farther than it had been before. After half an hour, he, began, he again slackened the pace and made another observation, finding to his astonishment that the dark mass had almost doubled in apparent size. Dorothy, noticing, noticing his expression, was about to speak, but he forestalled her. We lost ground instead of gaining that spurt, he remarked as he hastened to his post. It must be inconceivably large and to exert such enormous attraction at this distance. We'll have to put on full power. Hang on yourselves as best you can. He then pushed the lever out to its last notch and left it there until the bar was nearly gone, only to find that the faint disk of the monster globe was even larger than before. Being now visible to the unaided eye, revived, the three others saw it plainly, a great dim circle, visible as is the dark portion of the new moon, and the power shut off and they felt themselves falling toward it with sickening speed. Perkins screamed with mad fear and flung himself groveling upon the floor. Margaret, her nerves still unstrung, clutched her heart with both hands. Dorothy, though her eyes looked like great black holes in her white face, looked ashamed in the eye and 
steadily. This is the end, then? Not yet, he replied in a calm and level voice. The end will not come for a good many hours. As I have calculated, it will take at least two days, maybe more, to fall the distance we have to go. We have all that time in which to think about our escape. Won't the outer repulsive shell keep us from striking it, or at least break the force of our fall? No, it was designed only as protection from meteorites and other small bodies. It is heavy enough to swing us away from the small planet, but it will be used up long before we strike. He lighted a cigarette and sat at case as though in his own study. His brow wrinkled in thought as he made calculation into his notebook. Finally, he rose to his feet. There's only one chance that I can see. That is to gather every scrap of copper we have and try to pull ourselves far enough out of the line so that we take a hyperbolic orbit around that body instead of falling into it. What good will that do us? asked Margaret, striving for self-control. We'll starve to death finally, won't we? Not necessarily. That will give us time to figure out something else. We won't have to figure out anything else, Doctor, stated Dorothy positively. If we miss that moon, Dick and Martin will find us before very long. Not in this life. If they tried to follow us, they're both dead before now. That's where you, even you are wrong, she flashed at him. They knew you were wrecking our machine, so they built another one, a good one. They know a lot of things about this new metal that you have never dreamed of since they were not in the plans you stole. Duchesne went directly to the heart of the matter, paying no attention to her barber shafts. Can they follow us through space without seeing us, he demanded. Yes, or at least I think they can. How do they do it? I don't know. I wouldn't tell you if I did. You'll tell if you know, he declared, his voice cutting like a knife, but that can wait until after we get out of this. The thing to do now is to dodge that world. He searched the vessel for copper, ruthlessly tearing out air, almost everything that contained the metal, hammering it flat and throwing it into the power plant. He set the bar at right angles to the line of their fall and turned on the curtain. And turned on the current. When the metal was exhausted, he made another series of observations upon the body toward which they were falling and reported quietly. We made a lot of distance, but not enough. Everything goes in this time. He tore out the single remaining light wire, leaving the car in darkness, save for the diffused light of his electric torch, and broke up the only remaining motor. He then took his most, almost priceless switch watch, his heavy signet ring, his scarf pin, and the cartridges from his pistol, and added them to the collection. Flashing his lamp upon Perkins, he relieved him of everything he had which contained copper. I think I have a few pennies in my pocketbook, suggested Dorothy. Get him, he directed briefly. While she was gone, he searched Margaret, whose result, save for the cartridges in her pistol, as she had no jewelry remaining after her imprisonment. Dorothy returned and handed him everything she had found. I would like to keep this ring, she said slowly, pointing to a slender circlet of gold set with a solitaire diamond. If you think there's any chance of us getting clear, everything goes that has any copper in it, he said coldly, and I'm glad to see that Seaton is too good a chemist to buy any platinum jewelry. You may keep the diamond, though, as he wrenched the jewel out of its setting and returned it to her. He threw all the metal into the central chamber, and the vessel gave a tremendous lurch as the power was again applied. It was soon spent, however, and after the final observations, the others waiting in the breathless suspense for him to finish his calculations, he made his curt announcement. Not enough. Perkins his mind weakened by the strain of the last few days went completely insane at the words. With a wild howl, he threw himself at the unmoved scientist who struck him with the butt of his pistol as he leaped. The mighty force of Duchesne's blow crushing his skull like an eggshell and throwing him backward in the opposite side of the vessel. Margaret lay in her seat in a dead faint. Dorothy and Duchesne looked at each other in the feeble light of the torch. To the girl's amazement... The man was as calm as though he were safe in his own house, and she made a determined effort to hold herself together. What next, Dr. Duchesne? I don't know. We have a couple days yet, at least. I'll have to study a while. In that time, Nick will find us, I know. Even if they do find us in time, which I doubt, what good will it do? It simply means they will go with us instead of saving us. For, of course, it can't pull away, since we couldn't. I hope they didn't find us. I hope they didn't find us, but locate the star in time to keep away from it. 
Why, she gasped. You've been complaining to kill both of them. I should think you would be delighted to take them with us. Far from it. Please be logical. I intended to remove them because they stood in the way of my developing this new metal. If I am to be out of the way, and frankly I see very little chance of getting out of this, I hope that Seton goes ahead with it. It is the greatest discovery the world has ever known. And if both Seton and I, the only two men in the world who knew how to handle it, drop out, it will be lost for perhaps thousands, hundreds of years. If Dick's finding us means that he must go too, of course I hope that he won't find us, but I don't believe that. I simply know that he could get us away from here. She continued more slowly, almost speaking to herself, her heart sinking with her voice. He is following us, and i he won't stop. Even if he does see this dead star, knows that he can't get away, we will die together. There's no denying the fact that our situation is critical, but you know a man isn't dead until after his heart stops beating. We have to two old days yet, and in that time I can probably dope out some way of getting away from here. I hope so, she replied, keeping her voice from breaking only by a great effort. But go ahead with your doping. I'm worn out. She drew herself down upon one of the seats and stared at the ceiling, fighting to restrain an almost overpowering impulse to scream. The hours wore by. Perkins dead. Margaret still unconscious, Dorothy lying in her seat, her thoughts and formless prayer buoyed up by her faith in God and in her love lover. Duchesne, self-possessed, smoking innumerable cigarettes, his keen mind grappling with its most desperate problem, grimly fighting until the very last instant of life, while the powerless space car fell with an appalling velocity, faster and faster falling toward that cold and desolate monster of the heaven. And that's the end of chapter 9.